The views expressed in this podcast are solely those of the podcast host and guest and do not necessarily represent those of our distribution partners, supporting business relationships, or supported audience. Welcome to Transacting Value, where we talk about practical applications for instigating self-worth when dealing with each other and even within ourselves, where we foster a podcast listening experience that lets you hear the power of a value system for managing burnout, establishing boundaries, fostering community, and finding identity. My name is Josh Porthouse. I'm your host, and we are redefining sovereignty of character. This is why values still hold value. This is Transacting Value. You know, I was that high performing, you know, ex Marine who was working in the Pentagon and doing all the things. And on paper, I had it all together. And looking back now, I can confidently say I was having an identity crisis. Today on Transacting Value, what do you have to do when you transition different roles? Well, one of those things is obviously figure out what it's going to move into. But what happens if you don't know who you are to narrow down the list? Today's conversation, we're talking with the host of the Talia Ray podcast. She's a business coach and she was commissioned in the Marine Corps. We're going to talk all about it. Her name is Talia Ray. So without further ado, folks, I'm Porter. I'm your host, and this is Transacting Value. Talia, how you doing? Hi, Josh. I'm doing well. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks so much for having me on the show. I got to tell you, not for nothing, and I'm sure you're aware because you've got people on your show as well. A lot of people say that, and it's really difficult to know if it's serious and genuine. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. I'm kidding. I'm genuinely excited. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I really do appreciate the opportunity, though. Which coast are you on? Where are you? East, West, Central? I'm actually in Nashville, so no coast whatsoever. I am landlocked AF. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I it was going to be the next answer I asked, obviously. So, uh, okay, so you're in Nashville, you're in Tennessee. So where are we at here? Good evening, then. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So saying that, uh, let's take a couple minutes, right? At least for right now, here in this season of the show, we're only releasing the audio. And so this is kind of like what happens. I think they did an interview with, uh, what's the kid's name who played Spider-Man in Avengers? Oh, um, uh, British kid. Holland. Shoot. Um, Tom Holland. Tom Holland. I should know that. Yep. He did an interview and he said the hardest part about being a superhero in the Avengers is the mask. Because nobody can Mm -hmm. see your expressions. So you really have to sell it over the top. Yeah. That's to say, nobody's going to see your face on this conversation for the time being. So let's take a couple minutes and just set the stage. All right. However you like, but who are you? Where are you from? What sort of things have shaped your perspective? Oh my gosh, that's a loaded question. Um, Well, my name is Kalia Ray and I was actually born in Southern California. I was born in like the Long Beach area. Grew up there, the oldest of four kids. I was homeschooled growing up. You know, that's a whole thing in and of itself. (laughs) But when I was 20 years old, I commissioned in the Marine Corps as a second lieutenant. I was very young. I was actually able to graduate early from college So I was Baby Bastion. That was my nickname at OCS and the basic school. And I did the Marine Corps for six years, learned a lot. It really was formative in terms of who I became as a person, who I became as a leader, and then did what a lot of people do. You know, I got out after six years and I went to the consulting side of of the house, like most uh, transitioning officers. I was stationed at Quantico and then at Fort Meade in Maryland. So I was living in and around the DC Beltway area. And uh, I got into government consulting as one does. Realized it wasn't for me. I absolutely hated it toward the end there. And this was around COVID timeframe. Um, so I decided to quit my job, become a coach, start a business, start a podcast, And here I am like four years later. So it's been a wild, wild ride. Yeah, that's a journey for sure. Mm -hmm. But you stuck with, I mean, essentially coaching is consulting, right? It's a little bit different slant, but it's basically the same idea. Ish, ish. So I would say consulting relies on the consultant's subject matter expertise, whereas coaching is all about the client's subject matter expertise. And it's the job and the responsibility of the coach to like not bring their agenda into the coaching space. So a little bit of a different impetus, but essentially, yes, you are talking to people, you are advocating for them. So similar, I guess, in that respect. 
Okay. All right. So a lot of it obviously then is the why questions, the how questions, the what, when, who type questions, describe, tell me more type stuff. Very open-ended questions. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you're not really pushing your stuff. So then what good does your experience do you? It sounds like then you went from specializing pretty highly, well, in the defense industry to then moving Mm -hmm. into an industry now where it's not about you and your experience. So how do you translate? Yeah, that's a really great question. So obviously, all of my experiences like formulated and shaped who I am and like the philosophies that I have, the attitudes and belief systems that I have. And it's really my story that inspired me to become a coach in the first place. You know, I was that high performing you know, ex Marine who was working in the Pentagon and doing all the things. And on paper, I had it all together. And looking back now, I can confidently say I was having an identity crisis. I was having a post-military identity crisis and no one talks about this. Um, but I was kind of functionally depressed and I wasn't happy. And that story being a high performer and having it all together on the outside is what I coach my clients around. So my experience allows me to empathize with where they're at in their life right now. My experience allows me to guide them, to present frameworks, to present tools and tactics to empower them to get out of the cycle, you know, the merry-go-round that they're on right now. But ultimately, I'm holding up a mirror for them to then be able to take action and decide how they're going to break toxic patterns in the present in order to make momentum on their goals in the future. I see. And so then that mirror you're holding up is propped up by what your own experiences, insights, or research you do about them as a client? It's a little bit of both. It's a lot of helping the client hear what they're saying. You know, a lot of us externally process and we just say things to say them or we say things not realizing what we're actually saying. Case in point, I was having a conversation with someone who was a very high performer, but hated his job, really hated different aspects of his life. Like he was having health issues and then he was having conflicts in his marriage. And, you know, I asked him like, if things don't change in six months from now, where does that leave you? And he laughed and he was like, Oh my gosh, like I'll probably be dead. And he like chuckled and like just kind of dismissed it. And I let it go. And then I brought it back a few minutes later. And I said, do you realize that in the course of five minutes, you've talked about death, dying, (laughs) depression, like all these things. And I just strung it together for him in like a couple of sentences. And he literally started crying on the phone. And he was like, I didn't realize how bad it was. So we say these things, these innocuous, you know, social idioms or these expressions that everyone just kind of says. And it's not until someone kind of presses pause and forces you to hear the playback of your own words that you realize like, oh, this is actually a problem. I'm not okay. Mm. So that's what I do in holding up the mirror. I totally understand that. I have a podcast too. I totally get it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. This this has become or developed into my own therapy, I guess. Mm -hmm. And, you know, something that stands out when it comes to, I feel pretty confident in saying any service members transition experience, because every single one of us goes through the experience, is everybody joins on some semblance, reason, scale, or scope for TRICARE. (laughs) Yeah. But but nobody wants to live with it after. Mm. And I think the crazy thing is, and maybe this was your experience as well. I don't know. I went to Quantico uh, to OCS in 2008 and I got med So I enlisted after that. But it was an experience for me because that was the first time I realized there's also plenty of people staying in because they're afraid of what might happen if they get out or seem like they're afraid if they get out. That is so true. And I don't know, I might get canceled for saying this or even speaking it out loud, but I would hazard a guess and say that a good majority of the military stays in much longer than they should or want to because they're too afraid of making that transition. And rightly so, like it's a scary thing, but it's also not as scary sometimes as I think we make it out to be. Steve Harvey has a motivational speech. You can find it on YouTube. If I remember what it's titled, I'll tell you before we stop recording. But it was all about flying, where you're never going to know how far you can fly until you jump, right, is the premise of the whole thing. And I think the point is the same. 
where, especially in my case, you get so stuck in what you're used to as a routine and thought pattern and maybe even habit of action that you don't have to think. It's autopilot for so long, the muscle memory atrophies in terms of individual recognition, character development, if it even existed in the first place. And if not, you're starting from a shunted position at point zero. And I think that is not a realization everybody hits, but it's definitely a realization everybody finds in hindsight. Uh, I wasn't as ready as I thought. The professional development is through the roof now, especially with the TAP program. But personal development is, I don't know, negatives, not existent in my opinion. So in your case, how do you go from, I'm going to be a commissioned officer and make a career of this, I assume was the initial beginning thoughts, to then no, this isn't for me because I've only seen it from the enlisted side of the coin. Well, I definitely had a very atypical experience in the Marine Corps. So I never deployed. I was a staff officer. My MOS was adjutant or what later became classified as a manpower officer. So I stayed in garrison for the entirety of my career. And I definitely appreciate the fact that like that is the lens through which I view the Marine Corps. However, I also had the opportunity to work in very close proximity to a lot of senior and executive leadership. So whereas most of my second lieutenant, you know, and other company grade peers were reporting to a major, I was reporting to a lieutenant colonel and eventually colonels and, you know, interface with general officers and being that close to the Pentagon, like you're just interacting with SESs and, you know, high profile, high visibility leaders. So I got to see a different side of the Marine Corps, I think, than most of my peers, even though I was in garrison and active duty for six years. All righty, folks, sit tight. We'll be right back on Transacting Value. Pass it on. This time of upheaval is causing me to look a little deeper inside myself, looking for some goodness. And this is what I've found. I'm more aware of my neighbor's well-being saying thanks to those who help keep my life as normal as possible. My mail carrier, my grocery cashier, my delivery person. I find myself caring about others instead of just looking out for myself. And oh, my goodness, does it feel good. Goodness is in you. Pass it on. From PassItOn.com. So I got to see a different side of the Marine Corps, I think, than most of my peers, even though I was in garrison and active duty for six years. And it really put a sour taste in my mouth for the military, quite honestly, because everyone that I came across was so siloed. Everyone was so focused on things that I just didn't agree with. I didn't agree with the priorities. I didn't agree with the leadership. I saw a lot of hypocrisy. I saw a lot of peacocking and you know, this isn't to say that everyone and every leader that I came across was this way, but it was a lot of it. And I just didn't appreciate the culture. Truthfully, I I knew that I was limited as Captain Bastion. Bastion was my maiden name. And I, I knew I couldn't be who I wanted to be as Captain Bastion. And so I knew that I had to get out. And I went into the military with the expectation that I'd only do four years. I did six years to get my master's degree. And as an officer, like there's a payback thing if you use tuition assistance. So I timed it to work with my career designation. It was a whole thing. But the Marine Corps was always supposed to be temporary for me. And I feel like personally, I was kind of shamed for wanting to get out at six years. But I knew that ultimately, like I was meant for more. And I knew that as a Marine, and I think that's an unpopular thing to say, but it's something that I think allowed me to be more successful in my transition story than unfortunately, a lot of guys and gals who make that their whole identity. Why? What aspect do you think has made you a bit more successful or apt to adjust more effectively? Because my identity never was fully the Marine Corps. Uh I was always very conscious of who I was and the fact that the Marine Corps was something that I'm super proud of and it was an accomplishment and it was noble service, but it wasn't who I was. And I think through no fault of their own, I mean, the military does this regardless of what branch you join, but we're told that this is who we are now. 
like the military does a great job of breaking down our civilian identity in order to then build us back up into a Marine or a sailor or a soldier, you know, whatever it is, an airman. And then when it comes time for us to transition out, they don't then do a great job breaking down what they've built in order to give us a new civilian identity. They just kind of hand you your DD-214, say, thank you very much, have a nice day. And then the transition focus is very employment-centric. It's not identity-centric. And unfortunately, I think so many people struggle a couple of years removed from active duty because they never did the preliminary work of transitioning their identity. They're trying to copy paste a military identity into a civilian structure and it doesn't work. But they, they feel like they're the problem and it's not their fault by any stretch of the imagination. And so I think we need to shift the conversation. And that's what I'm trying to do with my coaching. Okay, fine. Shift it towards what? Shift it towards an identity-centric transition conversation, which is... Yes, you served in the military. Yes, it was honorable service. Yes, you were a part of something greater than yourself. And hopefully you become so much more than that. Hopefully you take those skill sets that you learned. Hopefully you take those values and you're able to apply them in service to something else. We're not constantly looking backwards, appreciating what was. We're looking forwards. And that's what coaching is all about. It's about forward momentum and understanding the patterns in the present that are preventing us from executing on our goals. Ooh. Okay. So two things I've learned out of what you just said, and this is what you made me think of. One, uh, I just got off my active duty contract back in October, 2023. Okay. 14 years active duty in the Marine Corps the whole time. All right. The majority of my career was spent in the infantry. And so an instant willing obedience to orders that definition we'll use as a baseline for discipline here is necessary mm -hmm. in a kinetic environment because you're playing with milliseconds in some cases. So, Absolutely. so you don't necessarily have the time or the luxury or even the opportunity in some cases to think. It has to be mm -hmm. inculcated in your sort of instinctual response, muscle memory, whatever that action is. And in some cases, the words that you use, because if you get tongue tied on the radio I'm sure you heard maybe even at TBS that it's push to talk, not push to think. Mm -hmm. And then there's a problem. Well, that doesn't necessarily translate. And I agree with the point you made that it's difficult to move beyond that, especially mm -hmm. if you don't have the exposure or reason or justification to need to move beyond that. Mm -hmm. The second thing you brought up, though, that I thought was actually really poignant was learning how to convey that stuff once you have broken through it or seen a need to move past it. So I've been out now nine months and it has been for me emotionally, mentally, even just in terms of my maturity and perspective, one of the most fatiguing processes I think that I've gone through, except for the first time when I was at Paris Island. Yeah. And exactly what you're describing is exactly what I'm going through now. And I think even if you go back and listen to other seasons of this show, it has changed and evolved and refined as my own thought processes have. And I was just talking about this today, actually, that I don't yet have the vocabulary to describe the clarity that I need or a way to realign my identity with maybe what's a bit more authentic or what's more focused on what I want to do in terms of an impact on society. The vocabulary for the word that I'm trying to find, the definition in terms of how I want to what I want it to mean or the application of how I want it to apply to my life. I don't have the mental connection or acuity to really discern okay. that when it's compared to my previous skill set as a baseline. I don't know how to translate it. And so, yeah, I think the service you're providing is invaluable. And I think exactly what you're describing is exactly what needs to be stated louder and more frequently. Yeah. Um, like we said, the personal development really isn't there. And I'm curious, there has to be a system, and I don't mean the transition assistance program. I mean individually, personally. There has to be a system to transition steps, an acronym. You know what I'm saying, Talia? Scream the ditty. What's the transition mechanics here that you need to, that you recommend working through? Some sort of, you know, veterans love structure, some sort of systemic process. Have you discovered anything over the last couple of years with clients or on your own? 
I did. I actually recorded a podcast about this using the word leader and breaking that down to describe like not necessarily what goes into a transition from the military necessarily, but, you know, talking about what is necessary in order to get you from where you're at to where you want to go. But the L in leader stands for learn your gaps. Mm. And we like to say that we're very self-aware that we understand our blind spots. And the truth is you can never fully understand your own blind spots. That's why they're blind spots. And so anyone who tells you that they're fully aware of their blind spots and hasn't worked with anyone externally to them, I would challenge that. And I would encourage them to actually invite some outside accountability and outside support. And that's really what a coach does. But Learning our gaps is pivotal to understanding the real problem. I'll give you an example. A lot of my clients come to me and they say, hey, I don't really know what I'm going to do next, but I'm going to go to grad school. I'm going to go get my MBA. They think that the MBA is going to give them the solution to their problem, which is a lack of clarity because they don't know what it is that they want to do next. And when we actually work together and we strip away all of the presuppositions that they have around the MBA, they come to realize that the root of the problem, the gap that they're trying to fill is not a lack of knowledge. It's fear. Mm. The problem that they're actually trying to address is a fear of the unknown, is a fear of executing on the goal or the dream or the idea or the business plan that they have in their mind. And they don't feel confident. So they think that getting an MBA is going to make them feel more confident, but they're they're trying to find a solution to the wrong question. It's the wrong gap that they're trying to fill. So that would be one example in the leader framework of making sure that you're understanding the right gap and finding the right solution to fill that gap. Sure. And again, there's like other aspects of that framework as well. It's the, uh, the Marine Corps planning process. Right. It's Mm -hmm. the same thing. I mean, here's the crazy thing. As much as I wanted to stray away from all of these habits and thought processes that I thought were so ridiculously ingrained into, in my (laughs) experience, the Marine Corps culture, I said, oh, well, you know, eventually I'll get out. And when I do, I'm never touching any of this ever again. And what I all the same. Yeah, well, th- that's the thing. It is right. It's just a Marine Corps branded way of looking at all of these same concepts. And so when it comes to problem framing, for example, it's not so much a matter of where do you put the question mark, but is the question mark properly placed? And mm-hmm. I, I think that's exactly it. And then obviously, once you do, you can war game it and figure out what works and what doesn't. But in terms of identifying some degree of fear and then what to do about it, what happens if you have no idea? Because there's plenty of guys or girls, I guess anybody now in the infantry that get out and they say, I don't know what I want to do. I guess I'll go to school. And that's a four year plan that may work. But I call bullshit on on what? On the, I don't know what I want to do when I get out. I actually challenge that because Uh. I firmly believe deep, 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 deep down, everyone has a semblance of an idea of what they want to do. They just don't think that their idea is realistic. They don't think that their idea will make money. They don't think that their idea will support the reputation that they've built up for themselves. But they know, like if you were to put them on a yacht in the Mediterranean with $10 million a year, they would know something that they're interested in that they would want to pursue. Because the people who do have the yacht in the Mediterranean with a bajillion dollars a year are still working, right? No one is actually sitting in the lap of luxury all the time because that is intrinsically unfulfilling to the need that we have as humans to be productive and to be part of something greater than ourselves. So again, you could, you talk about, is the question mark placed correctly? Like we're just asking the wrong questions in my view. Alrighty, folks, sit tight. And we'll be right back on Transacting Value. Alrighty, folks, if you're looking for more perspective and more podcasts, you can check out Transacting Value on Reads Across America Radio. Listen in on iHeartRadio, Odyssey, and tune in. So again, you could, you talk about, is the question mark placed correctly? Like, we're just asking the wrong questions, in my view. Mm. Well, I think when it comes to alleviating ignorance, or let me say this, the lack of education 
creating the ignorance is mm-hmm. systemic throughout the DOD. And I think to some degree it has to be because, again, we talked about discipline and it's a war fighting function or fulfilling a war fighting function as an industry. So it sort of has to be so that way it stays focused. But I think, yeah, that myopic viewpoint of the industry and of the governmental department definitely shortchanges the ability of individuals out of necessity for a period of time in the contract. But after, yeah, it's tough to recover, especially if you don't know where to go, how to do it. You know, I've talked with a couple of people about this on the show, and it is pretty interesting to me. Uh, I'm starting to learn in hindsight. If you think about it, I mean, you said 20 years old, but 18 to 20 years old, you've got individuals getting into the Department of Defense. And this is, again, focused on the U.S., but you've got individuals as a baseline getting into the U.S. Department of Defense with not fully formed brains. And so, you know, we are taking then the next, I don't know, eight year contract to say, Mm -hmm. here's how you're going to think, view the world and act under certain stimuli and catalysts. So is it really Mm -hmm. that much of a shock that after that six to eight years or four to eight years, we don't know what to do? I mean, we've gone from, I think the first 18 years of life allows you to experience as much of life as possible, ideally, within a certain amount of controls and constraints. So you don't actually have to sacrifice much. Your parents do. But then when you turn 18, I don't think anymore, especially in 2024, that that cuts you loose. I think that gives you the ability to do it now without your parents always there. But then yeah. you've got your you've got their support, generally speaking, till your mid-20s. And then usually late 20s, you start making something out of your own life. But we go from high school and our parents to the DOD as our parents for 30 years in some cases. And unless you read books and run all the time and you're one bullet away, then what do you have to stand on? Conversations on Firewatch and in the smoke pit? That's not going to help too much. So how do you recommend moving through it? Here's another complicating factor that we don't talk about enough as veterans, which is the emotional disassociation that is required to be successful in the military. Absolutely. And this is seen in all different all different avenues, no matter what military career you have, right? Even just going through basic training, you are constantly having to shut down your physiological urges for warmth and shelter and safety and comfort. That doesn't even include the mental white knuckling that you have to do. That becomes a lifestyle. And if you're a high performer that is attracted to the military for that very reason, like I was, that performance mindset becomes a philosophy that informs everything that you think, say, and do. Mm -hmm. So now you're white knuckling through relationships and now you're white knuckling through your first civilian job and you don't like it, but you're a Marine. So you're going to push through and you're going to endure and mental and intestinal fortitude, right? And when you extrapolate that toward the guys and gals who are serving in combat zones, who have to kind of shut off their their limbic system in their brain in order to fulfill the mission, in order to take care of the people around them. And you do that as a lifestyle for years or decades, right? Of course, at the end of that period of time, you're not going to know how you feel (laughs) or be able to identify your feelings at all because you've so successfully shut them down. You haven't allowed yourself you know, because feeling is too traumatic. Feeling is too scary. And, and you kind of forget how. And, and that was my case. Like when I got out, I didn't even have like an exceptionally dangerous military career, but I got very good at shutting down my emotions, whether it's swallowing, talking back to somebody and you say, yes, sir, or yes, ma'am, like that's swallowing feelings, whether you're swallowing the pain, the physical pain that you feel and running your PFTs and, and all the things that you're doing physically to perform as a service member, like that's swallowing emotions. And you just get really, really, really good at it. So of course, you're going to get to the end of your contract. And to me, it makes perfect sense that when someone says, Hey, what do you think that you should do next? You're like, Oh, I don't know. Yep. Because you've spent a decade shutting down your emotions. And I think, you know, when we talk about an identity centric transition conversation, feelings have to be part of it. And people are very averse to having that conversation because they don't need feelings. They've operated just fine without the the F word, you know, yep. but that's the freaking point. And then three years later, 
they're having a mental health crisis, understandably so, but they don't know how to cope. They don't have the language around it. And my, my whole point is what made you successful in the military will not necessarily make you successful in the civilian sector, will make you a successful human, <laughs> put it that way, because you are a cog in a machine designed to complete a particular mission and bring everybody home. That's not a lifestyle that is conducive to the rest of society. And we don't talk about that enough. So when you talk about like, how do we make the transition? I think we just got to better educate these kids who are coming into the service. We're handing them an identity and a purpose on a silver platter and telling them to go forth and do great things and be successful. But then we don't tell them that, oh, by the way, this is also temporary. Mm. And like, you still need to be able to articulate your emotions. You still need to be a human. You know, your military transition should happen. You need to start thinking about it way sooner than 12 months before your EAS. Like this is a multi-year process. It took multi-years for you to become who you are. It's going to take multi-years to transition out of that as well. So it's just level setting those expectations. Like, hey, this isn't something you're going to do in 12 months or six months it's going to be a multi-year process, a multi-phase process. And I think it would help people maybe realize that one, they're not alone and they're not crazy. This is expected. Hmm. Once you hit your identity crisis, welcome to the club. You've arrived. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know about the DOD and for anybody listening who's unfamiliar, at the very least in the Marine Corps, we have this call it acronym to talk about these leadership traits qualities that you need to try to embody or strive for in order to have some degree of success in a leadership position, which in the Marine Corps means all of them. And what that revolves among a few things is tact and bearing. And mm -hmm. in certain times and places, there's relevance to that in society. But by specific definition, there really isn't the place for it. Because the application for tact, like you mentioned, in the DOD is just don't talk back on yes. the prevailing winds, I suppose. In certain circumstances, especially as you start to get a little more time in service, you get a little bit more play to that where you just got to know who you're talking to and then you can address and push back a little bit. You know, if they ap apply their thoughts more logically or more rooted in principle or history, and then it just gets conveyed as, I'm just going to speak your language, even though it's still not authentic to what I want to tell you. Well, Obviously, in society, it's difficult to recognize that when you get out, because like you said, you spend so much time, I don't even know what the expression is, disillusioned, I guess, that not only is it difficult to recognize the society you re-enter, because time doesn't stop for you. You know, we step out of societal reality into our own warfighting reality and then try to slide back in like I've been here the whole time, but it's a totally different place. The relationships, the people, the perspectives, the attitudes, the worldview shifts, the global event shift and the perception of those events shift, let alone interpersonal relationships and our abilities to communicate and convey anything we have to. And I think bearing, obviously, a similar comparison, but rooted in our behaviors and actions. Now, saying that each one of us individually has a unique set of qualities that I think informs how we perceive the world generally implied from our, or applied rather, from our, let's call it families of creation when we're born, or, or origin, I suppose, families of origin when we're born, and then families of creation like the Marine Corps inculcating a few others and maybe some different ones. But those qualities, I think, are what ground us. And that's what role I see values having. It's like, have you ever seen the Disney movie Aladdin? Of course. Cartoon or, my favorite. or Will Smith, either <laughs> or. But I have nothing in common with the genie. No matter how much I thought I did or feel like I should, I don't. I have nothing in common with the genie. But there's still aspects of his character that resonate with me. How he deals with situations, the choices he makes, how he deflects with humor because it's more comfortable, whatever. Well, those aspects that resonate with me are the values that genie has in his character because I have similar traits, flaws, or values, depending on your perspective. And so... That is a lot of, I think, what we need to try to convey because we can't custom tailor every response. In your case, as a coach or in my space, trying to convey that wisdom towards anybody listening. All right, folks, sit tight. and We'll be right back on Transacting Value. 
This message is from the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. VA disability compensation is a monthly tax-free payment to veterans who got sick or injured in the military and to veterans whose service worsened an existing condition. You may qualify for VA disability compensation for physical and mental health conditions that developed or worsened due to service. Learn more at va.gov disability. That is a lot of, I think, what we need to try to convey because we can't custom tailor every response. In your case, as a coach or in my space, trying to convey that wisdom towards anybody listening. And so I'm curious. This is a segment of the show called Developing, developing Character. character. Developing, developing character. character. So for anybody who's new to the show, Tali, you included, this is two questions where I really just want to identify aspects of your value system that maybe anybody else listening to this conversation can also latch on to for the sake of a little bit of resonance. And so my first question is, as you were growing up, what were some of the values that you were raised around or that you felt you were brought up on? It's interesting because all the values are important. And it's funny because I actually do a values exercise in my coaching program. The values that I was raised with were hard work. Both of my parents worked incredibly hard in, in various capacities. I come from Italian immigrants, at least on my mom's side. And, you know, the value of hard work was just always instilled in me at a very young age. I was taught that you had to work very hard for everything that you have. So I've always carried that with me. The value of honesty and honesty in that you are the representation of the labels that you wear. Mm. So, you know, being homeschooled, my mom would tell us growing up, and this is back in the 90s when homeschooling wasn't the thing that it is today. Like we were worried that CPS was going to be called on us. <laughs> um, but, you know, my mom would tell us, she's like, you represent homeschooling. You represent all these things. So make sure that your actions reflect accordingly. And I think like that was very well-meaning, slightly problematic in some ways, which we don't have to get into, but like that was definitely a value that I was raised to have. As I grew up and, you know, going through the Marine Corps and everything, I definitely valued leadership and quality. I saw a lot of leaders who didn't reflect quality in their style of leadership. Like it was very haphazard. I mean, you wouldn't really call it leadership, to be honest. It was very selfish. It was very self-serving. But I appreciated the quality leaders who had the presence and the intentionality to be where their feet were. Mm. Because I think we've all worked for those people who, you know, they're talking to you, they're having a conversation with you, but you can tell like their brain is off doing a million other things. The people that I really gravitated towards were people who were very present, very intentional leaders. And the quality of their leadership was reflected in it everything that they did to include the people that worked for them. Like it, it just kind of was a ripple effect. Once I moved out of the military, I realized like going through my own identity crisis, self-discovery process, I highly value authenticity. I highly value creativity and I highly value autonomy, hmm. which is ironic given that I spent six years in a very rigid, <laughs> structured, non-autonomous environment. I don't know if that's the right word, but no, no autonomy in the Marine Corps. So there was a values conflict there that I couldn't even identify until after I started working with my own coaches and realized like, huh, this is not synchronous. This is very asynchronous. And no wonder I was so frustrated for so long being in an environment that really stifled my creativity, my ability to be authentic and my autonomy. Fair point. But sometimes like maybe you learned on the, the rifle range or in any particular other environment, to identify your target best, you have to focus mm. on where it's not and use the negative yep. space to better shape the positive space. Oh, a million percent. Yeah. yeah. And so it may have been asynchronous, but in my opinion, it sounds like without it, you may not have identified as much value in where you sit now, let alone how to convey it. 100%. And that's the beauty of all life experiences, whether they're super positive or super negative, there's always a learning opportunity and we're informed by our experiences, right? So like 
everything is a learning opportunity. Everything is a growth opportunity. And 100%, I would not be where I am today with the perspectives that I have today and the belief systems that I have were it not for my experiences in the military, Mm -hmm. positive and negative. Yeah, well, that's the important aspect to note as well, right? Like we are a amalgamation of all our experiences and all our emotions, mistakes, failures, flaws, successes, happy points, low points, whatever. The trick is trying to figure out a way to take all that emotional baggage and put it into a little tiny travel kit and then (laughs) carry that around so it's useful enough. My second question was going to be, how have any of your values shifted and changed over time? But since we've already addressed that, and really sort of for the sake of time, I think this is going to be probably my my second or third to last question. But all of those things being said, now, of all the clients you've worked with, have any actually stood out to you as, I know exactly where you're at, your situation was me, I was you, or are they all really sort of unique in their own ways? I mean, every client is unique in their own way and like their own experience that they bring to the table. Even even the application of values is different. However, of all of them, the one that really sticks out is a former Marine, former Bloop Angel pilot, former Stanford grad, like works at JP Morgan, like just killing it on paper, absolutely killing it, like far and above anything that I ever did before or after my military career. And he would tell me how numb he felt in his day-to-day life. And that I resonate with. He would tell me how angry he was at little things. And he couldn't understand why he had such disproportionate anger for seemingly small stressors in his personal life and in his work life. And that I understood. I understood what he meant when he said he felt functionally depressed. Like he had this job that paid him half a million dollars a year. And he felt completely dead inside that I understood. And it just really stood out to me because I've coached people who make 80 grand a year and people who make half a million dollars a year. The identity crisis is the same. It looks the same pretty much for every single person. And that is the universal underpinning Mm -hmm. of the whole process that we go through. So I worked with him on his values. Ironically, one of his top values was also authenticity. And yet he kept putting himself subconsciously in all of these situations where he had to be fake, where he had to schmooze people, where he had to say things that he didn't believe, where he had to advocate for programs and processes that he knew were garbage. And every time he did it, it killed a little bit of his soul. We call it a values violation. And I asked him, at one point in our in our coaching relationship, I said, how much of your life do you spend in a values violation? And he was like, dude, it's 90%. I didn't realize how much of my life I mm. spent being inauthentic to accommodate other people. And I was like, well, no wonder you feel numb and angry and all the things like you're, you're not being true to who you are. So what does that look like? And that was a whole other can of worms that we had to explore. So He stands out to me because he was willing to do the hard work and he was willing to make a massive pivot in his life and face the fear and and let go of a lot of fear of losing his reputation. But you know what? He's a lot happier now. (laughs) A bit. And he doesn't wear his accolades like armor the way that a lot of us were taught to. Mm. That is huge. And also, just for the sake of clarity, I don't think that it's specific or exclusive to the DOD service members, veterans. I do think it is pretty consistent across extended exposure to occupationally high stress environments. And so from teachers to lawyers, to cops, to EMTs, firefighters, veterans, single moms, in some cases, I think this type of misaligned contribution to burnout is prevalent in all of those. It's not just the DOD. So there's definite applications. I mean, you mentioned he was a a pilot, I think you said in his case, but you know, there's definite applications to what you're doing and how you're conveying it and the topics you're bringing up that I think are way farther reaching than the DOD and probably in most cases way further reaching than U.S. borders because it's, it's global. It's a human condition especially to be, you know, nose blind to your own smell, I think is the expression. So 
it's just how it goes. You know, that's, that's why it takes a village to raise kids. We're really just older kids. You know, we haven't changed anything. And so if mm-hmm. you're growing up without a village, you find a coach and then you make one, you know, and, and I think there's a lot of, well, a lot of value in what you're doing. Now, let me ask you this real quick. Actually, I'm tight on time. I don't want to close out until I ask you of all of these experiences, what has it actually done for you and your own self-worth? Mm. You know, it's funny because six months prior to quitting my consulting job, I wrote out on a piece of paper in two columns, what I want, semicolon, (laughs) what if I dot, dot, dot. And it was one of the first times in my life that without qualifying what I wrote or judging it or asking myself if it was realistic, I just let myself write. And one of the things that I wrote was, I want to make an impact. I want to feel fulfilled. And the sense of fulfillment that I get watching someone in real time have a massive breakthrough. And it's not me doing it. Like I'm holding up the mirror. I'm asking the questions, but it's their process. They're setting themselves free. But once they have that shift, there's like this light that comes on in their eye and like they start taking a whole different path. You can see that whole new trajectory. And to know that you played a very small part in that process if I could bottle that feeling for everyone, I'd be richer than Jeff Bezos. Like that sense of fulfillment, nothing can touch it. And so to be a part of that, to actually have purpose in that, I don't have words to describe what that does. And I've never found anything that can touch that feeling. Even if you're working in other ways and being of service to other people, that for me has just been the best part. Mm. All right, fair enough. Well, to compliment that, in case you ever come across anybody where this may apply, I think any service industry position, you're going to be able to see something like that where people have an opportunity to instigate that degree of growth or self-worth in other people. You know, in, in my case, like my day job, I'm a licensed Florida realtor. And so I can do that with clients and see them come around to the material aspects of negotiations and transactions, but also when they get their keys or when they're able to move, or when they're able to move on in some cases. And I know exactly what you're describing. And again, I don't know the vocabulary either, but it is a a powerful thing. Talia, for anybody who wants to reach out to you, either to be a client, to listen to your podcast, just to follow along with you, find out more about you, whatever applies, where do you recommend people go? Where do you want them to go? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm very active on LinkedIn. Like I said, I I post content four to five days a week. So you can find me at Talia Bastian, B-A-S-T-I-E-N in parentheses, Ray, R-H-E-A. And that LinkedIn page has links to my website, my podcast, my coaching program. You can find everything you want to know about me there, or you can check out my website, www.taliaray.com. Easy. So for anybody who's new to this show... Depending on the player you're streaming our conversation on, you can click see more, you can click show more. And then in the description that drops down, that's where you'll find links as well to get to all of Talia's information, uh, her website, and obviously her social. So you guys can reach out to her there as well. If that's easier for you to find her, feel free. Talia, I appreciate the opportunity, the conversation, the insight, the degree of authenticity and, and just openness that you are willing to talk about and have. And I'm actually a little surprised that what you were saying is exactly what was going through my head, but I didn't know how to say it. So I I appreciate you standing up and standing in front to convey a lot of that publicly, but ultimately, thanks for your time. Thank you, Josh. I really appreciate the platform and just the opportunity to get the message out there. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm sure there's plenty more opportunities coming your way as it applies to marketing. Obviously, it's, you know, frequency or distribution and somewhere between the two, I think you're going to find plenty of outlets because it's more popular than maybe our listeners might realize as far as topics go. But saying that to all of our listeners and everybody that's tuned into the conversation, thank you guys for listening to our show. If you guys want to get involved or just listen to more of our other conversations, you can go to our website, transactingvaluepodcast.com, and you can find all of our other seasons and conversations there as well. You can reach out, leave a voicemail, Uh, Let us know what you think of the show, what you think of the conversations. If you want to contribute any time, money, talent, advice, feel free and we'll take it. 
uh, with an open mind and open arms. If you want to be on the show, you can let us know as well. Send an email to transactingvaluepodcast at sdytmedia.com and we'll be sure to get in touch. Thank you to our show partners and folks, thank you for tuning in and appreciating our value as we all grow through life together. To check out our other conversations or even to contribute through feedback, follows, time, money, or talent, and to let us know what you think of the show, please leave a review on our website, transactingvaluepodcast.com. We also stream new episodes every Monday at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time through all of your favorite podcasting platforms like Spotify, iHeart, and TuneIn. You can now hear Transacting Value on Reads Across America Radio Eastern Standard Time, Wednesdays at 5 p.m., Sundays at noon, and Thursdays at 1 a.m. Head to readsacrossamerica.org slash transacting value to sponsor a wreath and remember, honor, and teach the value of freedom for future generations. On behalf of our team and our global ambassadors, as you all strive to establish clarity and purpose, ensure social tranquility, and secure the blessings of liberty or individual sovereignty of character for yourselves and your posterity, we will continue instigating self-worth and we'll meet you there. Until next time, that was Transacting Value.